Hello and welcome to the IRI seminar series from the Institute of Advanced Research in Artificial Intelligence. I have the great pleasure of introducing today's distinguished speaker, Melanie Mitchell. Melanie Mitchell is the Davis Professor at the Santa Fe Institute. The Santa Fe Institute is dedicated to the multidisciplinary study of the fundamental principles of complex adaptive systems, including physical, computational, biological and social systems. Melanie wrote her PhD in the research group of Douglas Hofstetter, the author of Gödel Escherbach. 
the members of the research group called themselves Fargonauts for Fluid Analogies Research Group. During that time, she developed Copycat, Modeling Creative Analogical Thinking in Letter strings, strings. She is a self-declared analogy nerd. Melanie is the author or editor of six books and numerous academic papers in the fields of artificial intelligence, cognitive science, and complex systems. To name just two of her books, the award-winning book, Complexity, A Guided Tour, and her latest book is Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. In her recent papers and blog posts, she asked why AI is harder than we think and whether GPT-3 can make analogies. The title of her talk is Abstraction and Analogies are the key to robust AI. During the talk, you can already ask questions in the chat, both via Zoom and YouTube, and we will take up the questions during the Q&A at the end of the talk. Really looking forward to this talk on abstraction and analogies and what it means for current scientific practice in AI and ML. Without further ado, I leave the floor to you. Looking forward to this talk. And it over to you, Melanie. Thank you, Christian. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm going to just you. share my screen here. So I'm going to talk about abstraction and analogy, which I think are really the keys to robust AI. Most of you probably are familiar with the summer research workshop on artificial intelligence proposed back in 1955 by McCarthy and other pioneers of AI. They were very ambitious. They proposed a summer, what they called a two month, 10 man study in which they would try to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans and improve themselves. Well, obviously all of these things are still open questions in the field, but the most understudied and I think most important question is how to get machines to form abstractions and concepts. So we have had a revolution over the last couple of decades in the form of deep neural networks, of course, and they have uh, done amazing things, including revolutionized computer vision, starting with the ImageNet object recognition computation, uh, competition. And um, in that competition, which started before the uh, revolution in deep learning, uh, here's a plot of the best program and its error rate on that corpus of object recognition problems. Uh, and in 2012, of course, the um, first deep neural network was entered and the error rate was dramatically decreased. And over the years, as the networks became deeper and deeper, the error rate decreased even more until it was below this estimate of human performance on this data set. But the real question though, for computer vision and similar uh, incredible results in things like speech recognition, language um, processing, language generation, robotics, and so on, is that wh what exactly are these machines learning? Um, well, sometimes what they're learning is fairly surprising. Here's an example from my own lab where one of my um, former graduate students trained a deep neural network to distinguish animals photos of animals with photos that did not contain animals. This was a, uh, from a large nature photo repository. And the neural network did very well on this task. But when my student kind of looked under the hood of what was going on, he found that in large part, uh, what the uh, neural network had learned was to focus on the, the backgrounds and the, um, presence of a blurry background was a good predictor of an animal in the photo because most of the animals were in the center and the photographer's focusing on the animal. So the background's blurry, whereas in no animal photos, uh, the lands, their landscapes, and so the background is clear. So this is often called a shortcut in machine learning. It's a common phenomenon where the machine is learning some cue that allows it to do quite well on a particular data set, but 
the um, statistical correlations no, don't always carry over to the general case. Uh, another example um, of this kind of uh, thing was when a group tried to take a deep neural deep neural networks that performed well on web images, images scraped from the web, like those in the ImageNet uh, data set, take the same categories, but have the photos be taken by a robot with a camera moving around a household. So uh, they took a few of the same categories from uh, ImageNet, uh, took photos from both web scraped images and from the robot images. And when um, a network was trained on the same kind of data, it, uh, uh, it was tested on the same kind of data it was trained on, all of these deep neural networks performed very well. This is the accuracy between zero and one. But when that same deep neural network was trained on data scraped from the web, but tested on the same categories of photos taken by the robot, uh, the performance went way down, meaning that uh, th these photos of the categories of objects um, were in some sense out of the distribution of what the network had learned from its web-based uh, data. So the the deep neural networks were focusing on some features of these images that were not general, that were not the same kinds of features that people focus on. This has been shown in many ways. This particular paper showed that um, a deep neural network that is able to accurately recognize images with very high confidence, this 1.0 is the confidence with which it's recognizing this as a school bus, but if the researchers Photoshop these objects into strange poses, the neural network is now very confident that it's seeing different categories like a garbage truck or a punching bag, or here uh, where it recognizes a fire truck or a school bus. It, it, it's now thinking that it's a school bus with 98% accuracy. I mean, sorry, 98% confidence, fireboat, a bobsled. And so again, this just shows that these networks are using certain non-human-like features to recognize these objects. This was also shown in a different domain, in the domain of um, reinforcement learning, where a deep Q learning network, like the one that uh, DeepMind used to uh, learn to play Atari video games at higher than human performance, when it was trained on one of those games, Breakout, and was able to um, surpass human performance on this game, Breakout's a game where you move a little paddle, here this red paddle to hit a ball, to uh, collide with bricks, um, these, these bars of um, bricks up here. When the researchers tested this same neural network on a version of the game where the paddle was shifted up by a few pixels, it was unable to do well at all. So it's somehow learned certain features of the pixel configuration here that allow it to do well on this version, but it was not able to transfer its knowledge to this really similar version where a human would have no trouble at all. And we've all seen these kinds of adversarial attacks on vision systems, for example, uh, putting uh, some stickers carefully arranged on a stop sign can force a vision, a deep neural network vision system to perceive this as a speed limit 80 sign with high confidence. So it seems that what networks are learning is more akin to perceptual categories rather than concepts, the kinds of rich concepts that are that humans learn that are very robust. And so this is the kind of difference between uh, the more br brittle and vulnerable things that networks learn versus what humans are perceiving. So Lawrence Barcelou, um, a well-known cognitive psychologist defined a concept as a competence or disposition for generating infinite conceptualizations of a category. That is a concept 
is a generative model. It's a way of taking a category, um, like for 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 example, um, uh, the, any of the ImageNet categories that you like. You know, a dog, a cat, a truck, a school bus, and being able to generate examples of it. It's more of a generative than a discriminative model. So one example, you know, is the notion of bridge. You could imagine a deep neural network learning to recognize bridges from many examples, but they would not learn the more robust idea of bridge that humans have that allow us to generalize, for example, to this kind of bridge, which is a um, kind of an inversion of a normal bridge. This is in which boats cross this water bridge that goes over a highway or to recognize something like this as a bridge where ants are being able to cross a gap by creating a bridge with their bodies or the notion of bridging your hands or the bridge of a nose or the bridge of a song. So this is a way that we humans are able to take a concept and generalize, uh, generate not just concrete examples of it, but more um, abstract and even metaphorical versions and to understand those quite easily. And you can go further, more abstract, talk about bridging the gender gap. Uh, I noticed that Joe Biden described himself during his uh, presidential campaign as a bridge to a new generation of leaders. And we understand that instantly without even noticing how abstracted it is from the concrete notion of a bridge. And you can just go on and on. There's so many examples. And bridge is not the only concept that has this generative property. It's really all concepts. So while Barcelou just described concepts as being able to infinitely generate examples, Hofstadter um, described a concept as a package of analogies. And I like this definition also because it, it really shows how when we're extending the notion of a bridge or any other concept, we're really making analogies. We're taking the concrete example and we're making analogies to more abstract examples. And analogy is really the driving force behind our ability to abstract. So the question is, how can we get machines to learn concepts in this very more human-like rich way rather than the more shallow perceptual categories? And how do we get them to make analogies? So what I'm gonna do in this talk is to, um, talk about some of the AI methods that people have um, developed and the domains they, they work in for studying this phenomenon of abstraction and analogy. I'm gonna talk about three different uh, domains um, and then talk about how we might make progress in this area. So I'll start with the um, deep learning systems on Raven's progressive matrices. So you may have heard of Raven's progressive matrices. They were originally created decades ago as a kind of human test of abstraction and, and analogy making. Um, they, um, the idea is that you have this matrix of uh, figures, a three by three matrix where the last entry is blanked out and you have to select from a set of possible answers. So here you can see that there's some something varying along the rows and the columns. And we can see that there's like this vertical bar that is varying um, in color and orientation. And there's also an underlying shape that's varying um, in uh, the, what the shape is. And you can see after some study that the answer here should be five. Here's another one. So here we can see that, you know, we're taking the first two in a row and combining them to create a third and that the answer here should be number eight. So uh, these, pro the, these problems were first created by a psychologist named uh, Raven who created hundreds, or hundreds of these problems and used them as a kind of IQ test for people 
psychologists have said that performance on these Raven's problems is highly correlated with intelligence. I'm not going to, that's controversial. I'm not going to argue about what that means, but rather talk about how people have in AI have adopted this domain in um, to get AI systems or machine learning systems to perform abstraction using deep learning. So here's kind of a little history of that. So here's how you might use a deep learning approach. Uh, you would take the eight figures in uh, the matrix plus the eight possible answers and use them as um, just the pixels of those, those figures as input to a deep neural network. And the goal is to uh, generate a probability distribution over the eight possible answers so that the network can pick the highest probability one and that one will be correct. Well, Raven, the original psychologist who, who created this domain, um, only created hundreds of these problems for humans. Uh, but as you know, deep learning approaches need lots of data to be trained. And so um, people decided they would generate Raven's problems automatically. So this particular data set, uh, Raven with capital letters, was generated by a group who used a stochastic grammar, kind of an image grammar, where uh, they had a certain number of primitive shapes and colors and uh, range of sizes and um, other attributes and would choose layouts and attributes stochastically to be able to generate any number of these problems. And they were able to generate, they generated a benchmark data set that had 42,000 training examples and 14,000 test examples. So now people started um, applying their deep neural networks to train and test on this domain. So just a few examples, you know, in this domain, you can um, have problems that, for instance, um, monotonically increase the number of objects or um, have uh, some kind of inside outside structure uh, here or uh, and here, you know, you can see that, you know, you have the same shape inside is outside. Here we have um, a system where we're varying uh, the um, number of uh, the inside objects, monotonically decreasing them, and so on. And so um, in 2019, in CVPR, this uh, data set was published. And also, the researchers um, tried out different versions of deep neural networks. Um, which I won't go into the details here, but, and they also tested humans using a crowdsourcing platform and found that the deep neural networks were yet still quite far away from human performance. And these are all different types of problems. And these are the average accuracy. But of course, once you have a benchmark data set, uh, people improve on it rapidly. So even the same year at the NeurIPS conference, uh, a group showed that their deep neural network uh, was able to it, um, surpass humans on this data set and even more surpass them here the next year and so on. However, remember I talked about shortcuts in machine learning. Well, in 2020, another group showed that there are actually shortcuts in the Ravens data set. The way that the answers were generated unintentionally allowed a, a system to just view the answers and be able to solve the problem. So the way that the answers were generated was that the correct answer was taken and one attribute was modified for each of the uh, seven other possible answers, which allows a system to be able to just take the answers and look for the majority along each attribute. So here we have the shape, the most common shape is a pentagon, the most common color is black, and so on. And you can choose the answer 
without even looking at the context matrix. So this was a big problem. You know, even after a lot of people had published results, it was shown that this data set was biased in this way. This is a train on candidate answers only. You can still uh, do just as well. Okay, so then this group proposed a fix, which fixed that particular bias and showed that then uh, just training on answers alone gets you back to the um, random choice uh, accuracy. Okay, so now, um, again, we're back to um, below human accuracy on this new fixed data set, but the same story happens again. We get improvements. Uh, 2020, somebody shows that on this balanced Raven data set, they've now surpassed humans and surpassed humans even more and surpassed humans even more. Okay, so we're back now to the question, what did these machines learn? Did they actually learn abstract visual reasoning or you know, ab abstract reasoning or analogical reasoning? This is what these papers are claiming, but they have, to my mind, they haven't really proved it. Do they actually learn abstract concepts? Well, so I did a study with my um, uh, an intern, Victor Odard, who's been working with me this year, to evaluate these systems using what we call concept-based evaluation. That is, instead of just taking a training uh, data set and dividing it randomly into a training set and a test set, assuming some kind of, you know, IID distribution, we do a different kind of evaluation. We identify what are some of the underlying concepts in the test examples, and then ask, given variations on that concept, does the system, is the system robust to being able to recognize or understand the concept in its many possible instantiations. So for example, we took a concept we called sameness, where the simplest version for the Raven data set is just everything's the same along each row, okay? But you can make variations on that where uh, some things vary, there's some differences, but the underlying sameness is the, um, uh, the underlying sameness is the shape or uh, the color or um, the size. And you can vary sameness along different uh, uh, dimensions here, same number, uh, uh, you know, same number here, uh, same number inside, uh, same angle, uh, and other kinds of sameness. A second concept we looked at is monotonic increase or decrease, where we have like one, two, three, one, two, three, three, four, and then the answer would be the one with five. Um, or monotonic increase or decrease, say, in shade of gray or in um, number of sides on the objects. And you can vary this, uh, these concepts. Here's the variation in color. Um, uh, say, uh, number of sides, again. Uh, and you can vary these in different ways. So you get the idea. So we created manually, um, as a proof of principle, the, the sameness, 210 sameness variations in 80. Uh, monotonic increase or decrease problem variations that had a range of sort of complexity. All of them were designed to be relatively easy for humans. And we looked at two trained models that had done better than humans on um, the um, original Raven data set, okay? And we said, what if we now test them on these concept-based evaluations? Okay, uh, well, we found that their generalization on sameness, their accuracy along this, these concept variations was only 62%. And monotonic increase, decrease here was only 68%. And here even worse. So 
trying to show these variations along a dimension of a concept reveals a lack of understanding of particular concepts in this us uh, in this space and so in systems that are so you know prone to learn shortcuts i think it's really important to probe them to probe for their understanding their ability to do actual general say abstract reasoning so in general deep learning approaches have a number of limitations on these abstraction benchmarks as i mentioned they require a large corpus of training examples so you need to generate them automatically which can make the data sets susceptible to these shortcuts and this procedural generation makes them less interesting you know they, they're constrained to have certain primitives and certain ranges of size and color and so on the original um raven set actually was a lot more interesting but very small compared to you know the tens of thousands of examples and none of these systems would be able to do uh solve problems on the original set the trained networks are not at all transparent what did they learn um and again from deep learning approaches typically uh they rely on this kind of multiple choice answer generation they don't generate their own solutions and finally if the goal is human-like abstraction abilities it really doesn't make sense to have to train on tens of thousands of examples when Raven gave his problems to people, they weren't trained on the system, they, they, on the domain. They, they were doing really zero shot uh, uh, solutions. They weren't, they were trained on, they were, these problems were meant to test abstraction abilities in general that people had learned throughout their lives. And so it really doesn't make sense to have to train a deep neural network to, um, on, a very large corpus to be able to do these problems. Really, the essence of abstraction analogy is few shot learning. So let me tell you a little bit about a different architecture. This is one that I developed with Hofstadter that actually addresses many of those limitations I listed above. This is an old, this is old work, but um, I think it, it is um, has a lot of potential for applying this kind, these kinds of ideas now. So we looked at a different kind of analogy on these, uh, an idealized domain using letter strings. So analogy problems like if the string ABC changes to the string ABD, what does the string PQRS change to? Well, there's no sort of uh, formal description here that, that requires a single answer, but um, most people will say PQRT. They'll say, okay, the rightmost letter changed to its successor. So we'll do the same thing here. But then, you know, if you, you can complicate that by putting in groupings of letters, where if you want to, instead of changing the rightmost letter to its successor, most people will here change the rightmost group to its successor, saying, okay, a grouping of letters plays the role of a single letter. And, um, you can also look at problems that reverse strings or ask the, um, to sort of fill in a sequence, missing letters. And it's a very open-ended domain, even though it's, you know, superficially looks very simple. We have, we, we think of these uh, as idealized situations that have objects, relations, groups, you know, events that happen, things change. And it's really meant to be a tool for exploring general ideas of abstraction and analogy. The, the architecture we developed called Copycat was inspired by ideas from neuroscience and psychophysics. For instance, the ideas of Anne Treisman, who looked at the dynamics of perception. That is, perception isn't just a feed forward process like in a neural network it's a dynamic process where your eyes move around and there's feedback that when you see one thing your uh that causes your eyes to look in a, another uh specific direction um and there's um treesman showed that there's a shift in perception between 
what she called pre-attentive uh, processing, which is parallel, you know, very, very random bottom up and more deterministic focused, more serial attentive top-down processing. Uh, there was also work in neuroscience that emphasized the importance of sort of working memory as, even in the visual system where the uh, early areas of the visual system are sort of like blackboards in which you can store temporary information and there's interaction between what's stored on the blackboards and what's being processed in higher areas. And finally, the notion that um, there are temporary data structures in this working memory, um, which interact with longer term memory. So I'm our project, um, the copycat architecture, had this kind of working memory we call the workspace in which um, the problem was stored and the system was able to build these kinds of data structures that um, were the result of uh, computations in higher areas, the more permanent network of concepts and were uh, created by what we called perceptual agents or codelets, small pieces of code that could build small data structures like a grouping of letters or uh, another grouping or a relationship between two letters or a correspondence across strings. So this was meant to model this kind of view of, of how perception works in a very dynamic way. It was controlled, all of the processing was controlled by a temperature. When the temperature was high, these agents would perform very randomly but as they built structures, the temperature would lower. And so it was a feedback. The temperature was uh, feeding back between creating randomness in the workspace and being lowered to create, become more deterministic as structures are built. So let me show you a little video of this program running. Oops, didn't want it to start yet. So what you'll see here is these agents making explorations and notice this is happening over time and when exploration yields some kind of possible relationship that feeds back you can see the temperature lowering you can't see the concept network uh, in this demo but you do see the workspace and you see these little agents building these structures that produce feedback among each other so now this this notion of grouping according to same letter catches on and the whole um, the fact that this is a sequence of letters that's been perceived as a sequence of letters feeds back to make this more likely to be uh, perceived as a sequence of letters. The system is able to parse it to describe this as reverse direction of string and to translate that according to the fact that uh, single letters go to groups of letters as reverse direction of the group. So um, that's an example of the program at work. So importantly, um, analogy making is seen as kind of a perceptual process. It might be in the mind's eye where representation is actively built over time. Uh, again, a, a dynamically integrating uh, more symbolic conceptual knowledge with sub-symbolic uh, probabilities and top-down, bottom-up processes, and a continual interaction of prior knowledge from cons the permanent concept network with more bottom-up perceptions and context. And like in Anne Treason's work, we see in this system uh, uh, at the very beginning a very bottom-up more parallel random explorations taking place by these agents. But as the program starts to make sense of what's going on in its input, it shifts to a more top-down serial and deterministic mode of processing. And that transition is emergent, it does not programmed in. Now copycat itself has a lot of limitations. Its architecture is fairly ad hoc. Uh, it, works on this letter string domain, but could the architecture be expanded to other more complex domains? 
It has been to some extent, but it's still not clear how general the architecture is. I personally think it's quite general, but that remains to be seen. It doesn't learn. So the question of how to form new concepts beyond what's given in its repertoire, the, what humans have given it. You know, it has a repertoire of concepts and it uses them to build uh, representations of a new analogy problem, but it doesn't learn new concepts. So let me finally talk about one last um, domain, which I think is really interesting. This was proposed a few years ago by Francois Cholet of Google called the Abstraction and Reasoning Corpus um, or ARC. He proposed it in a paper in which he uh, said that we, we need um, domains in which to really compare machines and humans in a fair way that don't use language that we can overinterpret or anthropomorphize, but, and also only require a very few shot learning and are based on what Elizabeth Spelke has proposed is our core knowledge systems, the, 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 the idea that uh, we are sort of innately given notions of objects, of space, geometry, numbers, numerosity, agents, and actions. So that's how Cholet formed his problems, thinking about these concepts. So here's an example, um, what he calls a task. The task uh, has three demonstrations. These are kind of like in the letter string analogy, uh, you know, ABC goes to ABD. Here, this grid gets transformed into this grid. Similarly, this grid gets transformed into this grid and so on. And now here's your test example. So you have three sort of training examples, if you will. And now I give you a test and say, do the same thing, generate the new grid. So you have to generate the answer. And you can see that, you know, the, the concept is sort of take the, this idea of horizontal array of colors versus vertical array of colors. And humans can see that very easily. But the challenge is to get a machine to know enough about the core concepts that uh, have been proposed for human knowledge to be able to apply them in this domain. Here's another example. Um, you know, we can see easily this is like extend this uh, structure to the boundary using the, the, the different color here. Um, this one uses the idea of some, a stripe of colors uh, being above another stripe and then switching the above versus below. And here kind of locating a similar or uh, the same shape. So here we locate that shape to get that and so on. So Cholet created ma manually um, what he called a, a, train, a training set, which is 400 tasks just to give people an idea of what the different concepts are, and then an evaluation set in which they could use to kind of test their programs. And then finally a hidden test set, an evaluation set of 200 tasks that uh, people didn't have access to, but they could submit their program uh, to test it. And this was put on the Kaggle website, which uh, gives machine learning challenges, you know, $20,000 prize money for um, solving it to a certain degree. And the best programs were able to solve about 20% of the hidden test cases. And they each were given three guesses. So it wasn't just one guess like a human might have. So still these programs, these programs were not very general and they're still not doing very well. Uh, there was an entertaining blog written by one of the authors of the second place, uh, challenge. We obtained the code for this and we did the same kind of concept-based evaluation of that program that we um, did for the um, Ravens problems to sort of interrogate how well this program understood concepts on the on the on some of the problems that it succeeded on. So we looked at two kinds of concepts, one that involved top, bottom, or above, below, and one that involved uh, interacting with a boundary. So just as an example, here's a, 
a, a, a problem from the um, original uh, ARC data set that this program was correct on, you know, extracting the color of the line that is above all the other lines. But then we looked at some variations on that, extracting the object or that is above all the other objects. It was not able to do that. Um, moving one object below another object or above, I'm sorry. Um, it was not able to do that. Here's another one on the boundary where all the, um, all the little uh, two, two square uh, objects move down to the line, um, down to the boundary or over to the boundary. It was correct on that one, but not correct on several variations that we tested it on. And I won't, I won't go into the details here. And so what we found was that it's, while its performance on the original ARC test set was 19%, it actually did do slightly better on our variations on top bottom, but much worse on our variations on boundary. So we were able to interrogate how well it understood certain concepts. This was really a pilot study. You can see there's not very many examples. So right now we're extending this. So to finish up, the big question is how do we make progress on this really important set of abilities that, hum that underlie human intelligence, that underlie our robustness? And this is from a paper I published recently. Um, I believe we, rather than people having all these different tasks like the letter string analogies, the uh, Ravens analogies, the arc problems, we really need a common suite of tasks. And the, the ability to show that a program can uh, do this kind of abstraction across different domains. I think these idealized domains are really useful. We can be very explicit about the prior knowledge and assumptions, and we can avoid anthropomorphizing language-based tasks, which we've seen happen again and again. Uh, we need to evaluate our systems not only on accuracy, but on generality across different tasks, like I've shown, and the ability to generate rather than simply recognize solutions. The ability to, to do few shot learning or few shot abstraction. Robustness to modifications like the concept based evaluations I showed and being able to scale to more complex examples. So we should rate systems on all of these different factors rather than just accuracy. Okay, so I'll stop there um, and happy to answer any questions or hear your thoughts. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Melanie. So let's open for question and answer. Um, maybe maybe one one qu question um, relating to 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 what you said on on Cholet's arc. Um, benchmarks seem like a huge driver in in the field. So one question: Would a copycat style let a string benchmark be a good idea, or may, maybe not? And do you see other drivers or incentives, maybe coming from applications? or, or um, from, from theoretical interests? I think that we need, um, I, I, I think these idealized benchmarks are useful, but um, that we people shouldn't just focus on a single one of them. They need to focus across different benchmarks, sort of like the way the natural language um, processing community is focused on multitask benchmarks, like if you're familiar with the glue and super glue benchmarks in language processing, um, that, that you're rated, you're rated on like how well you do across different tasks, not just a single task. Um, and I also think we have to, you know, obviously these idealized benchmarks have limitations and, you know, the ultimate goal is to use these systems on real world examples and real world tasks. So you have to kind of be able to go from uh, developing systems that can do abstraction on these uh, more idealized problems to more real problems. But it's a way to, you know, get started without having to deal with all of the complexities of the real world.
Okay, here, here is a question from Rahul um, Siri Purapu. You distinguished between perceptual categories and concepts. However, it seems that concepts are not always timeless, like the concept of Lockiston. We decide that perhaps at some point in the future, only a few concepts from today may survive with others being classified as perceptual categories. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Um, so, so I think there's, you know, concepts is a very wide category, if you will. <laughs> you know, we have kind of everyday concepts that we use to understand the world that are probably pretty robust. And then we have more temporary concepts that we use to, um, in science, for example, that get thrown out when we understand the science better. Um, you know, phlogiston and the ether and all of those uh, are examples, but maybe, you know, some people have proposed that, you know, the things that we describe our mental states with like consciousness might actually be one of those concepts. Uh, so there, yeah. So I think there, you know, there are, we're here in AI, we're talking about very, uh, even just the most common, ordinary common sense ideas uh, that are hard for AI systems to grasp. I think those will be around for as long as humans are. There is a question from Ivan Schwogor. Thank you for this great talk. It points out the curious problem in AI and learning concepts is really an area that requires more exploration, um, but also understanding. It should be increasingly important to understand what the models really learn under the hood. So uh, his question, um, should, should, should you make us focus on what machines learn? But do you see how can, can we bring that down to the level of engineering models? So in, in, your, view, in your view, how should the models look? Should we maybe even move away from backprop-based approaches? Um, yeah, my personal view is that um, the current approaches like um, deep neural networks and trained with many examples using backprop or whatever are limited and that we're going to um, have to move beyond those. You know, one of the, there's lots of proposals for sort of hybrid symbolic neural AI. Some of them may end up not working very well, but it does seem like we have to capture something like this, the symbolic processing that it seems that people behave and perhaps we'll be able to do that eventually with neural networks, but it doesn't seem like we can do that right now. So yeah, I mean, that's a big question is how, how far can these uh, backprop uh, approaches go? And another question, uh, you, um, you, um, while uh, looking at the copycat architecture, um, you mentioned this uh, workspace idea of, of competing agents. This looks very appealing from very natural for, from, from a human perspective. Uh, well, we have competing inner drives. Can you comment on the work that is currently being done in ML using this idea, what it achieves and what you see maybe as the next achievable steps um, um, in this area? Um, so, so by this area, I wasn't sure exactly what that meant. Um, there, there is a paper you refer by, by Gole, which, um, which refers to this idea of, of, of workspace. Oh yeah. Having a workspace. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this, this idea of, um, Kind of having a memory, a working memory, in which you can represent objects and um, instances of objects, and so on. That that's that that's part of a lot of different cognitive architectures that people have proposed, but uh, that I think that approach has lately. People are trying to do that within the deep learning framework and it hasn't worked out so well. Um, so I don't think there's a lot of work in that area. Um, and I think there should be more. Uh, you know, this is uh, something that is in more cognitive models than in AI systems to date. 
Oh, okay, excellent. Thank you so much for an amazing talk and an insightful discussion. Thanks everyone for joining and looking forward to the next talk in our seminar series, which will be announced on the IRI website. We're also happy to get your feedback on the seminar. You will receive an email with a link to the feedback form and the slides. The video will be put online in the next few days. Thanks again and have a nice evening or day wherever you've been joining us from. Bye for now. Thank you.